Bonjour, Rika. Hi. Bonjour. <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate the effort. How many, do you speak many languages? Because you, you live both in London and America, right? That's pretty international. Yeah, so I'm, make, I'm making my permanent move to America, hopefully this month when everything comes through with this waiver to get into the States right now. Um, but yes, I, I'm picking up on speaking Spanish, actually, um, because a lot of Spanish is spoken there and, uh, and also obviously Mexicans there as well. So a lot of Spanish I'm picking up, but I'm not fluent. I wish I was, but that'll work on that to become more fluent. Um, but I'm not fluent in other languages, but I pick it up as I go along the circuit when I hear people speak. And I like the French accent, it's beautiful. Oh, thank you so much for appreciating this. And I, I wanted to touch base on that because I know if you can tell us what you do with Film Festival Doctor, but also I know you've attended so many festivals around the world, right? Yes, yes. So my company is called the Film Festival Doctor. And what we do is we create for our clients successful film festival strategies and place their films in the right film festivals around the world, get their films seen. So we've worked on, as you mentioned, uh, lots, of, lots of great movies. We've had lots of great results in the circuit. Um, we've won for our, we've helped win for our clients now almost 900 awards and we secured wow. um, for our clients after longness list and one Oscar nomination back in 2016. So yeah, so amazing journey never stops uh, and it's really exciting and I've been to loads of festivals all over the world, loads in Europe, loads in America, loads in UK. So I love going to film festivals, even online. It's great as well as online, but it's quite in person, but it's amazing experience. What experience? Because obviously we're going to talk about how you work with festivals and how you support filmmakers. Because I confirm like the work by your filmmakers is incredible. I love how heartfelt it is and they're really fantastic. Also people to be around. I love your positivity. So we're going to touch base on all that and your kind of book. Uh, as a more, more as a human and you know, I, I guess also the big cinephile that you are, how are you living these transitional times and attending festivals with your filmmakers more hybrid way or online? How does that feel? How does it feel moving online? Um, so I've actually adjusted really well. I did it really quickly, the adjustment, because I was at the CineQuest Film Festival, which is a really lovely, really great um, film festival that takes place in San Jose, which is an Oscar qualifying festival. And I was there with two of my clients' films and halfway through the festival, got rescheduled to August because of coronavirus, because it was literally the day the pandemic kicked off almost. So I was in the States and I was in another festival that I had my own event to do. So it was quite weird because every day, every day was an email from a festival. So I had to cancel, had to move online, had to postpone, had to do this, had to reschedule. So it was quite like, quite shocking at that time. It was quite vivid emails that came through. I was like, oh my God. I remember, and I forget the time that we were at a Suez at CineQuest. And all of a sudden we all like just, everyone just stopped and paused and was like, South by Southwest has been canceled. Yeah, Is this... <laughs> it's <laughs> the world. <laughs> it was a bit weird. Everything was a bit odd, and we were at this massive party, so it's very strange. Um, so everything, yeah, went different. But I just did quite well because, as I said, all these emails came in like cancelling, cancelling, rescheduling, blah, blah, blah. but then people who said they're going to cancel then moved online, and some of them have done really well. Most of them have done very well moving online because it still feels that part of the festival. You got your laurels, you got the awards, it's, it's happening. It's just different that you're not there. But when you participate in online festivals and you you know, watch the films each morning and see the Q and A's and, and see the industry um, market, sorry, industry um, conferences and panels that are happening. You feel very involved in it still, and it's actually quite exciting. So it's adjusted well. I miss being at a physical festival and, and doing art, but I have been to some, because I have been, as you said, to hybrid festivals or festivals that have gone live but with limited capacity. So I went to the Romford Film Festival in UK, I went to the Jane Austen Film Festival in UK, and they were both fantastic, had a great time. Um, but they did well by being uber hygienic, uh, you know, in the masks and all that. So it was different having to keep a distance, but then also felt safe by having everything in place and just enjoying the flow. I think that's just so fantastic to hear because it sounds like really hybrid festivals have so many perks because you can attend both online or safely, like physically, but safely. And how, like, I also know you know the Valley Film Festival, like Tracy's Festival. Like, do you really appreciate those hybrid festivals? Do you think they're maybe the best way for your filmmakers to really enjoy? Because obviously, we know virtual has a lot of perks, so we're gonna come back on that. But would you say hybrid is probably a future, like a model for the future, something to really keep up with? 
Absolutely. In fact, one of the things that's come out of the pandemic is how great this hybrid model is that kind of came out during the pandemic. So no one had really done before the hybrid model because it was either, you know, no festival or it would be a live festival. But when filmmakers, sorry, when festival programmers began to use this model and it worked really well at TIFF, the Toronto Film Festival, it was here. I think it's going to be here to stay and I hope it does because it works so well. And for example, with The Valley, they've gone um, live, but they've gone on the, the drive-in format. It's another thing that came back during the pandemic, a comeback, was the drive-in model. That's a big thing, obviously, in the US. So they've done it every month at the Dallas Film Society and the Dallas International Film Festival, keeping people seeing movies in their cars and doing things by having this massive driving community, which has done really well. And the Valley, we're not sure what they're gonna do. Um, we had to reschedule to November, but Tracy you know, said, oh, we've, we've managed to get the Regency uh, drive-in, which looks fabulous. And Marcus Screen there, one of our films. Uh, and we've also got a short there called Cool and, and a documentary called, um, what documentary we've got there this time? Oh, uh, Words, uh, Words Don't Mean Anything. So we've got all those films there, um, which is amazing. And it's going down well, people are getting to see them. But TIFF did a really good job because I was following TIFF quite closely because they were the, it was a big test if they would actually go ahead and they obviously they did. And they had driving screenings around the US and Canada and they had screenings inside of the TIFF Bar Lightbox, their main HQ at headquarters, which is in obviously in Toronto, which is where everything happens of screenings of films. And they had online, uh, lots of online um, programs, which was predominantly um, the industry masterclasses, the conferences, networking and the marketplace obviously the marketplace and Cameron Bailey talked about he's the he's the founder he's sorry he's the director of TIFF and he's incredible because he did point out something very interesting that you know our films were noticed people saw the films there was hype about them we didn't need all the people in the streets of Toronto like it normally does to make that buzz so everything transitioned very well on Instagram Instagram lives Instagram stories Instagram posts screen daily obviously all the trades all the newspapers and people celebrating it via their social media map, uh, platforms themselves and obviously the trades and as i said but also the other other news articles as well just to keep the vibe going and he said you know we deals have been done deals have been made um even had, nobody was really here apart from people from canada so it was very interesting very interesting and, and he talked about it'll go next year hybrid it will be obviously more people hopefully by then but it'll still have the elements that are valuable that were online was getting outreach to the world and not just Canada. So there's lots of great things there and people saw it. Fifth festivals were like, this is really good. Um, we can actually get a bigger outreach by industry masterclasses and better networking because people network with the world, you know? So it's working, it's just different. I mean, it's not the same by any means. I mean, at a, at a festival, as you know, when we met at an independent film festival briefly, we were, you were like dressed up looking beautiful as always with your drinks. <laughs> There's going to be a pandemic in a minute, so let's let's just drink. <laughs> so that we'll get that online. Um, but it's a different way of networking, different way of getting um, a connection. It's a bit more formal, but it still works, and it's still very exciting. Well, that's that's really good to hear. Um, I love to hear your your tips. I'm sure you've explained so many times because like, you're on so many shows. I'm so amazed. I try to keep up with all of them. I made a promise to keep on all you're doing. It's really difficult. I have to book one, <laughs> <up>, you know. <laughs> but, but I, I really like so it always sounds like, yeah. <laughs> it's like every day. But I think I think it's wonderful because festivals play such a huge role in, in like all the time, especially in these transitional times. They really bridge the gap between the industry and the films, the filmmakers. And I feel right now they're being really valued for all the work they're doing because they were the first hit by it, but they're also the first actually find creative solutions, as you mentioned. And I'd love to hear your take on you have to advise not just your filmmakers, but just filmmakers in general on how we can really participate in virtual festivals. What are the perks and what would be your tip to best adapt to this new either hybrid or really virtual festivals? So the way to get really get a lot out of it as a filmmaker and that's what I do, you know, as a festival strategist, but anybody who's going to participate and really wants to engage with the festival and the filmmakers and network is to first of all, watch the films, watch the films, full stop. That way, when you start to network and have your Zoom Q and A's or you join a Zoom networking event, whatever it might be, you have that, oh, I saw your film, it was beautiful. I really loved it, blah, blah, blah. So you have that kind of icebreaker because you know the festival, what they're screening, you know the films and you have something to say. If you've got a film there too, they might have seen yours. So then you can then have a conversation about your film. 
but also it's important to know what you want because you've got less spontaneity at an online Zoom networking event. You know, like if in person you can just do whatever. But on the Zoom event, it's maybe not quite as spontaneous. You have to kind of know what you want, what your goals are. So you want to go to this networking event for a reason. What is the goal? What is the reason? And then you'll then be able to move closer towards that when you know what you want. You have a focus and alignment in mind than being all like, oh, let's see what happens. So you have a little bit more bit more of a, of a target and a bit more of a structure. And when you have that, it works. Um, and also to be yourself and not to be a different version of you that you don't want or don't know yet. Just literally be you. Turn up how you want to dress. See how you want to speak, but just know what you want from it. And just know what the festival is doing and see what they've had, the, what the previous, what the program is, what's happening live, what, what masterclasses are on, what screenings are on, what the talk of the town is, you know, that kind of thing. So that's, that's really important. Because I was, um, I was just attending now, we had two of our films, no, I think we had three, but two of them were definitely two of them or three of them at the Holly Shorts Film Festival, which is brilliant. And that moved online to BitPix, uh, which is a really good platform to screen films off and watch them on, online. And it was really brilliant. She felt like you were part of the festival, seeing the adverts before the films, then seeing the films, the CEO, one of the CEOs, and saying, I love that film, that was incredible. And then I found on Instagram, the filmmakers and connected with them. So Instagram's a really vital tool as well for networking because people do respond to that evidently well. And that way you form a very valid connection. And I've met some filmmakers now by watching Holly Short's films and, and Instagram. That is wonderful and so good to hear because, as you say, it's like knowing your goal as a filmmaker when you attend festivals is really important, right? And you know how you all, we always also say that um, before you actually even make your film, you should attend festivals. So you know what festivals like, you know what audiences like, and you, you can actually already anticipate in the development phase the type of film you're making because. Well, a great script is important, knowing your audiences is important. And I'm feeling, um, as you see, like now we have the hybrid and the virtual festivals. We don't really have an excuse anymore, right? Because it's also a lot less pricey to attend festivals. So you can really um, look at the lineups. I, I watched some great films, as you, on um, Los Angeles IFF, including Marcus, which is a really good film. Uh, also, Randall's, like really, and I was amazed yeah. by what you can see. And also, that by the networking opportunities, because as you say, it's quite easy to reach out to the filmmakers on Instagram, right? And you can request to Zoom, like I, I did that for JR, the director of Film Marcus, and it was wonderful. And I must say, I really loved it. Yeah. Like, I know it's so different from what we used to live, but at the same time, it's so wonderful that technology enables all of this to happen. It really felt real. And maybe, who knows, if the pandemic had not hit, I wouldn't have seen it because I couldn't have attended, or you never know what happens, we are so busy. So I think it's, it's really interesting what's happening. And about Absolutely, the, no, it is. About the drive-ins, do, do you think um, amongst like the most incredible opportunities, the new, like let's say the new festivals are, are bringing with the pandemic, do you, so you pick up on Instagram drive-ins, like Instagram lives, let's say drive-ins, is there anything else you saw, like do you see a difference with the networking or the panels, like would, would you pick up on anything else that you think is something we should keep? whether we are a filmmaker or a festival for later in the future? With networking at drive-ins, that tends to be not as much. People have to be in their bubble, in their car, so to speak. Um, so not that much, but it tends to be more like afterwards on the Instagram, just the follow-up. So people see the film and they follow on Insta, and then they have then chat on Instagram with the filmmaker, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of the drive-in community, it's, it's interesting because now the Academy have allowed driving screenings of films to be able to qualify for the Oscars. So when a film does a theatrical run, which has to be part of what they do for the Oscars duration, for each film, they can do it a drive-in, which is great because there's lots of them in the States. So that's a good thing. Um, but they're working well, especially so in Dallas Film Society have really done a really good job, I have to say. Um, because at the Dallas Film Society, they've been putting on pretty much every Thursday are showing like a classic movie at the drive-in. And also the Dallas International Film Festival have been screening previous films there, but also some of their lineup, because their festival was due to take place in April and obviously couldn't go ahead. So what they've been doing now for the past two weeks, they've had a shorts block of Texas shorts um, that have done well and also screening of one of their feature films as well. So having like intermittent once every week 
screening. So the festival is still happening just later in a bit of a different format and presentation, but it works because everyone, that culture in Texas is big, the drive-in theater. So it's normal. Here, it's not so much in the UK or France um, because we don't really have them. There's few and far between. Um, but in the US, it's, you know, it's kind of a big thing, but it's, it's, it's not cheap though to do. I saw of Tracy about it and you have to get license permits. You know, it's not rock up and hope for the best with a car. It is a bit yeah. more to it. Than, but then when you have people, you know, happily to pay that for a night out, it's fine. You know, it's the same price you pay with going out dinner or something like that or whatever, yeah. coffees or whatever. So it kind of makes a good balance. You have to bring your own alcohol, obviously, because you can't buy any alcohol because of um, Corona. So, you know, so it's fine. Um, but they're, they're excited. I can't wait to go to one <laughs> because it just looks so cool. Like I got the pictures back from clients of mine and the markets at the, the Valley Film Festival. Oh, I was yeah. like, wow. <laughs> this is so amazing. Cool. I want to be there. I, it's also a bit, a bit like we were there, right? With the pictures, it's like, wow. It's, it's yeah. And I think, I think there's something that's really important to remember, and I'm sure you'll agree, Becca, is that filmmakers should really remember no one's going to look down on them because they, they went through these times. On the contrary, I'm pretty sure later in the future, we'll look um, up to the filmmakers who actually went through these transitional times. Because these times are also here for pure creativity, whether it's about making the film or screening them at festivals. I think there will be there will be a special place for those who actually made the extra effort, effort and hand in there because it's a difficult time. So like really being able to screen films like Marcus and you have um, The Cunning Man and so many films that you represent, screen at festivals not actually, to me, at least to us, it will mean even more because they're hanging in there and they're making, the, they're kind of going the extra mile to tell these stories happen. And that, that's something I would love to hear because I'm sure you must be literally flooded with filmmakers contacting you from all over the world. I love her. I hear from filmmakers, from your clients who are from all contents and knowing the film festival, Doctor, I think it's great that you build this community. And I'd love to hear the, the, the filmmakers who come to you now for films. So I don't really become sometime in the development phase or just when the film is complete, maybe you can tell us a bit about that. But what kind of differences do you see in the films that are being made? Because obviously this year was so different. Yeah, so we come on board at any stage, um, development, so at script stage, or when it's finished, or when it's in the final phase of post, any of those kind of levels, really. What I have noticed is a lot more creativity coming out during the time when it was a lockdown, when the world was locked down for a couple of months earlier this year. There's been a lot of interesting stories and also ways to make a film on, with limited amount of people in, this, in, this, in the shot, basically. So there was a film which was very well written and very well crafted called Waiting for Time. And that's a very good short film with a very strong performance from the lead actor who's won like three awards now for best actor on the circuit. And they made the film actually like the day after lockdown in June. And it was easy to make because it was COVID friendly. So it was in one location, one actor, and every, there were other people involved in the film, but they could be from a distance in a way. So it wasn't any kind of risk. And mm -hmm. it worked really well, it, you know, it was brilliant. And that was all creative writing. And I've seen a lot of films made during lockdown that have been based upon the lockdown, which have been a lot more creative. I think the one that, I, that really stood out was um, a film told from the point of view of a little boy who began to miss going to school and his school routine and his school friends and his school lessons. And he was got a bit depressed because he was at home and not being at school. People don't really see how it affects kids. People think kids maybe enjoy it, but they don't. And this is really interesting about that side that we don't really see. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, and I think people are now more conscious of making movies that are COVID ready to, ready to shoot. Um, but I think festivals will never get a drought. Um, there was a worry there would be no like submissions coming in for a while because of maybe no, no, no production happening in a few months. But there's always a short film around. There's always a feature film around because people now have got time you're not done to finish it in post. So films we were attached to that were in the, fine, that were in the editing phase, weren't ready for months, they said, are now finished because they made them during, finished them during lockdown. So everyone's got very productive with their time during this period where they were locked down. Wow, that's honestly so inspiring because I think for the filmmakers now who are in development first, they know they can be in touch with you even now as they're in development because as you say, there are some things you really need. You would probably advise them to be in touch as soon as possible, right? Because in the development phase, they kind of need to know which type of scripts that, that, that will be successful depending on their goals. And also, I think it's really inspiring to know that um, filming now, if it's safe and if it's possible, can happen. We just really need to think out of the box. For instance, I was hearing of filming 
that was being made with actually the characters in the shop were masks. Because the thing we have to understand is now film, films should really represent also a part of reality. So if our reality is shifting, probably the film should just be embracing that and growing with that rather than just yeah. on our path, right? So it's it really fantastic. No, absolutely. And all the Zoom agree with series you. are great too. I know you have a project which has been filmed on Zoom. I think that's phenomenal. I think that's just... But honestly, it blows my mind away to see how filmmakers are super creative in these times, like Paris, where we're seeing such great films and scripts. And I'm, I'm amazed. I think this is filmmakers are just showing again how resilient they are and how much they love what they do because it's, it's, it's difficult times. Yeah, no, absolutely. A lot of films now are becoming a lot more eco friendly, a lot more, what well, a hygienist the word, but definitely more sanitized because of the rules and regulations and the insurance, and that's a good thing for future production. So really it's a lot of silver linings in this uh, situation that we're in, which doesn't always feel like it at the time, but then, you know, it's very good for, you know, for moving forwards, really. Um, so I agree, it's certainly a change for the better, um, even though it might not feel that way. Yes, yes, it's, it's difficult and we're all in this together. And there's something I really appreciate about your work and I'm not going to touch base on that because it's on your website, is your booklet on how to best attend festivals, how to best submit to festivals. Like you have this very comprehensive booklet with all kinds of tips and it's already so complete and I so appreciate that because you know how there are sometimes some, some people, which I think is a bit sad, who take advantage of the filmmakers and are like, oh, this is crazy and oh, this is terrible. And then it's like, oh, buy my book. But you're exactly the opposite of that, like all into education and you're really generous with tips. And then uh, with your talks, like you really, you really build this community and invite, you want like invite the filmmakers to be on the journey with you because it's so much work. So we all need help, we all need partners for distribution and also probably filming and press, etc. But you're really part of like educating the filmmakers rather than just like, you know, just trying to sell something. And I think I really appreciate that. I really love that. And about that, I would love to hear about Born to Do It because I have my Kindle right here. So I'm really excited for my copy coming on this December. It's only in, in a, 10 days now. So I, I'd love to hear about that. Is it, is it part of the and then, Yeah, so Born to Do It. So my debut um, book, Born to Do It, comes out on Kindle, as you said, December the 1st. And um, the paperback version is available now in UK and USA. It'll soon be available to um, purchase from Waterstones in UK and Barnes and Noble in the US. So it's in just getting registered now and getting catalogued, which is quite exciting. I've had reviews coming out now. I've had the first two and doing interviews pretty much every day. One or two interviews every day wow. for the, the PR. So it was interesting how this all happened with the book, because I wasn't, wasn't planning on writing a book this year at all. Um, but I was interviewed in an Indian book called Unique, A Positive Story is to Inspire You, which is where you talk in detail, like really in depth about your, like your life story, basically. And a publishing company uh, called Westerfly House read it and, and she said, you know, have you thought about telling your own story, you know, to, in your own book? Wow. Uh, not really. But then she talked to me about how books work and what they do for businesses and also how you write a book. I've written a PhD, so I kind of knew already how to write and she just gave me like show me how you how they work so we had a one-to-one -one session and she told me about how you have the structure book so I thought okay I'm gonna, I've got the book inside me now I know what I want to do so what I wanted to do the penny dropped is a lot of people spoke about that interview and they mentioned that they felt very um they didn't feel alone in their business and they, and they felt they were supported by doing the interview they felt like they were inspired and I was like oh I know what it is so what I wanted to do was write a book that was a how-to book using my personal story and it teaches you the book, how to tap into your sole purpose. So you know what it is that you're born to do, and what you're put on this earth to do, which is your sole purpose. And then it tells you how to build your first business using um, standard business practices and spiritual techniques, which are feng shui, manifestation, and cosmic ordering. And then it ties it all together and how you put it into it, in, integrate them all into your business to get the business that you want of your dreams. So it's very interesting how it came about because it took about two weeks to plan in detail. I was working on it like two hours a day each day the lockdown and then I wrote it and I wrote it quite quickly because I can write as I said you know I've got a PhD so I had to write quite quickly by then because I've done a lot of writing before and it all came together and now it's ready so it's quite wow. exciting but it's uh obviously, obviously it's mentioned all for it and what I do but it's very interesting and it's out there and I can't wait to read it and help them inspire them to tap into what they should be doing 
what I don't like is seeing people do what they hate and like not doing a job they want to do and feeling drained and bored and all that. So that's not what you should do in your life. And the parents should probably taught, taught you that by now, but you don't want to do something what you want to do is what's most important. Do what you're supposed to be doing, not what you think you should be doing. That's so true. I cannot agree more and I'm really excited for it. So now people can find your book. It's on your website, right? You can find it on Amazon or directly from you. Yeah, so my personal branding website um, is RebeccaLouisaSmith.com. It's all on there. And you also got linked to my Foster Doctor website as well on there. And I'll just know a bit more about me. Uh, so that's all up there. So that's um, very exciting. It just recently launched about a month ago or so. Um, and to find out more about what we do for filmmakers, the website would be thefilmfestivaldoctor.com. Yes, and we'll put all this info in the description for those who are watching and listening. This is all really exciting and I'm really, really looking forward to my copy. And talking about doing what you love to do, like what you're born to do in a way. What do you think about how do you feel and how do you contribute to diversity inclusive content? Because obviously we, we, are, we are actually raise awareness more and more about how important it is to really do what you love and also show all kinds of voices. And so how, I, I'm sure it's really connected with that because it doesn't matter if you're a female, you know, if you're a, a minority, indigenous, like wherever in the world, you should just do what you want to do. And how, how do you think your work contributes or how, how do you work with female filmmakers or filmmakers from diversity? What is your take on that? So with a lot of filmmakers uh, from all over the world, a lot of them are also from South, South Africa. So they obviously got diversity over there very few female directors over there um, that make features at least. So we work with them to get them out there. And I always like to bring out their goals. A lot of filmmakers, whether it's diversity or whether it's whatever, is they don't always know what they want. And that is actually tied to their sole purpose because they made the film that's thinking, well, let's get out the reasons why. So we know what the drive is and the ambition. We can really home in on the circuit to what we want to get from it really. Um, so that a lot of the time I really tune into them and say like, right, let's take it to piece, particular part to pieces. Why did you make this film? So what is the ultimate goal for you and for your career and for the film itself? Then we'll put them all together, then know which journey to take and which festivals to submit to, which ones to attend and where best to place the movie. So that's what I like to work with them is to really get specific and streamlined. So that's what you need to be in a very overcrowded market of film festivals. Definitely. And do you feel like um, through your work, you're actually actively contributing? Do you consider yourself a feminist and do you consider you're actively contributing to just make their voices known? Because this is what you do, right? You really bridge the gap between the filmmaker and the industry with distribution. Yes, very pro-females, female filmmakers and femininity. Absolutely. I love supporting our female filmmakers. We've got quite a few and they're all very, very strong. And also contributing as well, yes, to all of the human rights and Black Lives Matter, all of that, because we've got filmmakers that are of colour and I want to support them. So I'm always very neutral and always like to support all kind of good rights. I have no kind of bias, no kind of um, preference. It's very much a free for all. And I do, whoever comes to me with their work, we get the best job for them done. So yes, absolutely. That's fantastic. So we know we have a lot in our audiences who come from various backgrounds. We also work towards social change. It's also why we're having this podcast to actually educate our audiences so they can really, even during the lockdown, really educate themselves. Because it's all about education, right? Knowledge empowers you. And I guess it's the power of your book and what you're doing is that you really show that, you really show there's a certain way to do it, like filmmakers, they create their films. And then there is the distribution circuit and for it to make it successful, you will need to bridge that gap. And it's something really particular. So as a filmmaker, it's important to educate yourself. And then of course, it's difficult to do everything by yourself. So partnering with a partner like you, the film festival doctor, to have the films on the circuit, it makes a really big difference, right? So I think it's something really, really important. And I'm sure our listeners and people who watch us will highly appreciate that. That's really important. Would you like to tell us maybe um, a success story? I'm sure there are so many. You mentioned more by 900 awards and my social media are blowing up with all the selections and the awards. And I think that's fantastic. I, I love hearing positive stories, like even more now in lockdown. Would you like to share one or, or two maybe success stories or from a filmmaker who approached you and you're really proud of? Yeah, so for a feature film, probably Canary is a good one. The so Canary is a South African feature film, which is a interesting one because it's a LGBTQ war musical. So 
So it's a very, very striking piece of work. And I knew it was something special when I saw it. And the filmmakers didn't have any knowledge or connections of film festivals, of sales distribution. So what we did was we put the film on the circuit and we also helped uh, secure a sale agent for the film to sell it. Mm. And it won 13 awards, 45 festivals. It was a centerpiece gala screening inside out a big LGBTQ festival in USA. Outfest, a massive one over there. A Costa Rica, Molodist. So it did really well and it did loads of all the best at LGBTQ festivals and all those awards. And then when it got that sales agent who specialised in that area, LGBTQI, um, it got the best sales and now it's pretty much made its money back through sales with the right sales and the right awards at festivals and the right recognition. So that felt great. That was actually like, you know, it was just a film that was finished. No one knew about it. Now the whole world knew about it around the world because it could travel so far. So that was a great one for a feature. And with a short, um, probably The Cunning Man, I think that's the film that has done the most amount of festivals of any film we've worked on. It's done 75 festivals and there's more to come in. Wow. So more we make 80. I also did 100. That'd be nice. But yeah, so it's it's traveling and okay. then winning 25, I think, awards now. So yeah, this is a, it's an amazing film. But it's great to see that festivals just really resonate with it. It's been wonderful. And it's good that a film that they just planned. I mean, that film was just like, oh, it's made for a Aria Alexa film challenge. We haven't got any, fe any festival ideas in mind. I was like, really? And then they did come to me and I said, you know, you'd like to get it out there. They didn't know the circuit that well. They don't know the festival circuit that well. Um, but now they know it inside out <laughs> um, after all those screenings and they went to the most, well, not all of them, not, not all of them, God, not no one did, them. but they went to money as possible. And mm. we had, yeah, so yeah. I'm proud of that one because you know, they didn't expect this to happen. It's great that we exceeded expectations. Um, and The Box is also another one as well. The Box went, was a small film, you know, obviously like any of the short, not made for a huge amount, but it was really well done, a long time to make Labour of Love. And that went on out into the circuit, but it was slower stuff. Then it went bang, bang, and it went to loads of festivals and done lots of awards. And it's still traveling now. So it's a film that will keep going on the circuit because it's a popular one. So that's really nice to see. That's amazing. What about attending festivals, I remember it's one of the many things you point out in your book on your website is that you really must think in advance about submissions and just running the festival circuits. Because if you completely forget that, it can be really difficult because you have to think about the submission costs, attending, so obviously now it, it's a little bit easier, but there's always things of distribution that must be budgeted in advance or, or then your fee or like all these things are really important because the making of a film is so important. Then you really need again to bridge that gap because there's a lot of content on there and you really need to give, to give your films the best chances, right? That's something you really clearly explain in there. I remember that. Absolutely, without a doubt. You're right, you need, the first thing you need to do is create a very streamlined and focused strategy. And it does take time for you to know you're doing it right. So it's important to get support, someone like myself, to help you on that. Because if you make a mistake, you can miss an opportunity or you spend money on the wrong ones. You know, there's many drawbacks to that. Um, but yes, but you're right, it needs to be very thought out before and not start a gun. <laughs> yes. That's not as well. <laughs> yeah, that, that makes a difference. Is that I guess what you mean is that really it's about strategizing which means that if you do it by yourself, you may actually waste money on submitting to big festivals that maybe are not the right fit, whereas it's better to invest the money in a distributor like you who actually knows just how to give it its base chances because obviously again, it's really competitive. So it's about knowing also how yeah. to know your goals. And so that's really wonderful. Yeah. Maybe one, one last question. And of course, if you want to add anything, there's something we, we love to ask for <laughs> our guest is because um, France and Paris is so big with cinema. We'd love to hear what your take and your inspiration is from Paris. Does Paris inspire you? Have you ever visited? Can you share a story with us about that? <laughs> so, yes, I love Paris. I've been many times uh, to, I've been to the ECU, European Independent Film Festival, that was great, right in the center of Paris, um, at the beautiful cinema that they have it there. I've got the name of it now. But it's a great experience because it's very much a great culture. Everyone's out and eating and the great energy. And it feels really, you know, it's beautiful to be in. And also, I love France generally. It's not, this is not in Paris, but I remember the best experience I had at a cinema in France was uh, with my uncle before he passed away in a place called saint laurent de mortier which is a commune called Mayenne, which is kind of near Angers and in that part. And I remember went to see him and we went to see the artist 
at the local cinema and it was so lovely because I couldn't stand it because it wasn't in it was you know it's all subtitled and it's silent and it was just wonderful experience all these French people seeing seeing the artist at the right kind of place in a beautiful cinema wow. to weigh you'll never see it but, oh there's a cinema there you know it's just one of those little places so it has those quaint beautiful things about it and I can't wait to come back to Paris because it's beautiful part of, the, of uh, France. Yes, Paris is waiting for you. We'll be waving our flags for filmmakers in the film festival. That's wonderful. I love hearing your story because it's like, I feel in France, you always have like this story. Sometimes it's not what you expect, but it's all magical and you always remember. So thank you so much, Rebecca. This is so, I think this is so inspiring and knowing you're going to view as a strategist about what's what's happening and knowing that what's happening is really crazy so please all be really safe and really hanging there there's a silver lining there is a lot you can do even if it's difficult together with our community and this is what you do Rebecca with your filmmakers and you're always so supportive at all the talks like I, again I see all you do with your book and I think it really means a lot I really relate with that and we really appreciate that so thanks so much and we'll put all your info in the description merci encore Thank you. And you're like the oracle of the film industry, getting us all together and your great positivity. So keep that up. And we really appreciate it. Every time I get a message from you or I see something that you posted, it's always good that it's very upbeat, positive, and you see the right things to put out there. So congratulations also on the Golden Age and um, everything Thank else. You. Glad to be part of the tribe. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. And yes, the Golden Age is a tribute to artists. And again, it's, it's really, we love doing that. And we're so amazed by your filmmakers and all we're doing. So, we definitely know that this means a lot and this will bring a lot of positivity and support. Support is really important. Brilliant. Absolutely. Thank you. Merci.